Hello, welcome to the Cinema Crew with Village Cinemas. Who's going to help us start a war? With who? Everyone. Sicario 2 takes us back into the world of drug lords and FBI agents on the Mexican border. But is it all a bit of three cheers for America? Too few eyes, not into tentacles. Dad? No, babies! You need a vacation from running everyone else's vacation. When I took a look at the trailer for Hotel Transylvania, I was shocked to discover it's an animation. So we'll find out if I've missed one and two, if it's really worth seeing three. And I was excited for one of the first romance flicks of the year that I've come across, but turns out the poster for Adrift is a touch misleading. That's this week on The Cinema Crew with Village Cinemas. Hello, hello, my name is Kyron Wheatley, and we're here to sift through cinema's new releases before they've even been released. With a PhD in film, we are joined by Vari McIntyre. What's the most far out place you've seen a movie, Vari? Oh, I don't think it's been very interesting, but maybe the furthest away I've seen a movie is Edinburgh. I remember being at a Backpackers and they had its own little cinema set up with lots of bean bags at a and Backpackers? stuff. Backpackers? Yes. How and much they, were tickets? Um, free. Included in the cost? <laughs> Plus a bean bag. Crazy. Wow. <laughs> and Michael Campbell is here from Village Cinemas. So other than Village Cinemas Warrnambool, what's the most far out place you've seen a flick? Uh, I don't know. Has anyone ever tried the, the setting up a, a cinema as you're camping? We strung up like a bed sheet between two trees. We had oh. a little pocket projector. Which sounds great until you realise that the sound of nature is so loud that you can't, really can't hear <laughs> Just anything. the constant hum of cicadas yeah. <laughs> over everything. Pretty much, yeah. Well, think about that yourself and keep listening. We've got your chance to win a Village Cinema's Gold Class Double Pass a little later on. Cicada. Insert cicada sound. Cicadio. And then we'll talk about Cicadio, Cicadio 2. two. Your objective was to start a war between the Mexican cartels, not with the Mexican government. In 2015, Sicario took us into the world of drug cartels, FBI agents, CIA, and doing wrong things for the right reasons. So three years later, and Josh Brolin and Benicio Del Toro are back in Sicario 2, but no sign of the original lead, Emily Blunt. Cambo, is she missed? She's always missed, let's be honest. Every time she's not in any movie, you always think this could use Emily Blunt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, I need to say right off the top, my God, I didn't think I wanted a sequel to Sicario. Mm. And I was wrong, apparently. <laughs> yeah, right. So I guess for to catch people up, uh, Sicario 2 is... Uh, Josh Brolin's back. He's a guy called Matt Graver. And he is tasked with starting a war between the cartels in Mexico. And the way they do it is he enlists Benicio Del Toro's help to kidnap the daughter of a big cartel leader, and they want to start a war between the cartels, and then they can start taking them down. I like this film because it doesn't treat the audience as stupid. I like when they don't spoon-feed information to you. Um, so I really felt like this was a more intelligent, maybe, version of a, a horror action movie. Yeah, this film will kick your ass if you if you let it it's a real kind of uh the first one is a pretty heavy movie i think it's fair to say mm. and i think this one just ratchets it up even more than the even the original did and at, at first i was sad that um emily blunt's character wasn't going to be back but the more i think about it i think it's kind of a, a good move because her story was kind of complete well, that's what the writer Taylor Sheridan has said. Yeah, in an exactly. Interview. He said, I didn't feel like I could create something with that character that would further that world, that would do Emily's character justice. Right. And when, when you watch it, you kind of understand what he's saying is if you had a broader back in, it w- would have undone everything they had tried to do. But these other two that were really interesting in the first one, like, what are they up to day to day? And this is kind of what this movie's about. Yeah. It's like how you said at the beginning that you didn't need a sequel to this one. Yeah. Uh, it's a sequel nobody knew they wanted yeah. because it yeah it wraps up in the first one. I kind of went into it thinking, oh, like I did like the first movie, but just Josh Brolin and Benicio Del Toro will just be like, you know, two guys. Well, I was thinking, is it Boise? It looks really Boise and-, and just like, yeah, firing over the border. Yeah, and it starts out maybe like that, but then it turns into something more. It's like dramatic with something to say. It's it's got these um these undercurrents of this this world of the cartels and how much influence America has 
over Mexico. And what I really like about it, and this is true of the first one as well, and I think it's an underrated aspect, is it's kind of morally complex. They're not necessarily nice people. They're not yeah. necessarily doing good things. But in a way, in your brain, you're like, I get it though, you know. It's a bit, they're making the best of a bad situation or are they, would I have done that? Would I have tried something different? And I love that they don't tell you what's right and what's wrong. They're like, this is yeah. the, this is what we've presented to you. Make up your mind about it. Yeah. There's a bit of a bromance between Josh Brolin and Benicio Del Toro as well, which comes across in their characters. And there's the moral dilemma that the characters have as well, that they didn't seem to have in the first one. Emily Blunt was that moral dilemma character that the audience could connect with. Without her there, I mean, there's a couple of younger characters characters as well. Um, Isabella Mona, which you might know from Transformers, is the young girl that gets kidnapped. She doesn't have much of a role. Um, And then there's another boy that there's a parallel storyline with who is an American citizen, but helps immigrants cross the border from Mexico into America. And having these two younger characters in there brings the humanity to the story. It's one of those movies as well, like you couldn't think of a, a better time for this to be released. It's all about immigration. Yeah. It's all about that Mexican-US mm. border, which is like a hot topic at the moment. I mean, this week. But I, if you don't mind, I just want to gush about uh, Taylor Sheridan. And for those of you that don't know who he is, he's the screenwriter. He's only written a couple of scripts, but every screenplay he's written has been my favorite movie of that year. Sicario in 2015, this kind of like morally complex adult drama that... Wrapped up in an action film. Exactly, right? Like it didn't skimp on anything. And then uh, he followed that up the next year in 2016 with a a movie called Hell or High Water. It's a super tense bank robber film. It's got Chris Uh, Pine and Jeff Bridges nominated for a a couple of Academy Awards. And then uh, 2017, last year, he had this amazing murder mystery movie called Wind River with Jeremy Renner and Elizabeth Olsen uh, set in an Indian reservation and they need to work out who's killed this girl, but they don't really have police jurisdiction there. It's just this- These are all very different movies. Yeah, I haven't seen either. But they're always in such a unique kind of environment. One was about the global financial crisis, Hello High Water. Wind River's about the the rights of Indians on their reservations. And this, the Sicario movie is obviously about the immigration and, and the cartel problems that they're having in the- lower half of America. I love that he, he takes something like that and then just inserts really good human drama. Yeah, that's what really stands out in this film. It's about the individuals and them trying to fight against their government and their social place. There's one particular scene that really stood out to me, and no spoilers, but Del Toro's character is communicating in sign language with a deaf man that they come across and he really needs help. And the amount of emotion that is conveyed in that very short scene with not a lot of dialogue is just immense. The president's adding drug cartels to the list of terrorist organizations. You can understand how that will expand our ability to combat them. So Denny Villeneuve directed Sicario and then went on to direct like Arrival and Blade, Blade Runner 2049. Yeah. And he's this like amazing, amazing visionary filmmaker and he didn't come back for this. No, does it feel different because of that with Stefano Solomon? Well, oh, so I'd never heard of this guy and I had to look him up afterwards and I don't recognize anything he's ever made. Well, we're going from French to Italian director, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Somewhere in Europe, they'll, yeah. Yeah, they'll get it. <laughs> uh, he's great. Honestly, he's, he's fantastic. These movies uh, are really good. I think it's not so much even what you show, but also what you don't show. The fact that he holds back in certain scenes and he'll keep that camera locked down to a single person. That was what I was most nervous about, I suppose, is that, you know, those two elements were missing, Emily Blunt and, and Denny. And I really, I guess I should have had faith that this would come together because it really does. And he knocks it out of the park, I would say. Yeah, they do a really good job of keeping the the same feel and themes and emotion that the first Sicario has. I don't know. There's nothing like it. The music as well really sets up this emotion that you go into the cinema and it just starts with this deep bass rumbling and it really sets the scene and the mood and you get really into this Sicario world. Is there anything about the movie you thought was a bit of a miss? Anything that you're not going to enjoy? What I normally like about Taylor Sheridan is that he's he's really good at making sure that there is strong female representation, Sicario, Wind River. This lacks that a little bit. It's not to say that there's not strong female characters because there are. They're just 
less central to the plot than maybe his other movies. Yeah, and they don't even talk to each other. I, I, it just feels like I can't get over the fact that Emily Blunt's not in it. Hopefully there have been rumours that there will be a Sicario 3 and that she would be in it. So that would be something to look forward to because with her progression from the first movie, hopefully she would be a lot more of a rounded character and more confident and, and have more of a, an active role in the next film. So that would be something to look forward to. So who should see this movie? I mean, if you enjoyed those movies that I listed earlier that Taylor Sheridan has written, uh, you're, you're going to love this. It's, I mean, it's it's MA and it's a pretty hard MA. There's some pretty grueling sequences and it, it doesn't go where you expect it to go. But if you love a good, morally complex adult drama, then uh, go see it. It's, it's a contender for one of my favorites of the year. Yeah, if you like that hard action, a um, bit of thriller, but complex characters and real hard emotions, it's a good one to see. I recommend it. Hurricane Raymond has been upgraded to a Category 5. Should we be worried? I love you. Get below! I'm not leaving you! Get below now! Oh my god! Oh my god! Go! So, I heard about this true story of getting lost at sea being turned into a romance movie called Adrift, and I was sort of expecting a cliched romance like The Notebook, but I've seen the trailer and it looks more like A Perfect Storm. So, Vari, which is it? Yeah, it is a bit cast away across with The Perfect Storm, um, but it does have that romance element to it. Mm. So, now this is based on a true story. It was written by Tammy, one of the survivors, um, so it's based on her book. And it's about a young couple, Tammy and Richard, who sail their friend's yacht from Tahiti to San Diego. And on the way, they face one of the most catastrophic hurricanes in recorded history. Yeah, right. So this movie, I was expecting one thing, I suppose. It's being advertised as almost like a... You know, there's Nicholas Sparks movies like The Notebook and... Yeah, and, yeah uh, two yeah. white people almost kissing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's and the poster anyway. The poster yeah. is the classic two floating heads above a landscape. <laughs> well, that's what, I, that's what I thought. And then I watched the trailer. Yeah. And I, I, they're coming across a massive storm and yeah. it's like, get down! <laughs> yeah. I was expecting that as well. And even just... It, even just the way it's it's directed isn't like that at all. So the guy that directed it has a, a name that I cannot pronounce. I'll have a crack if you want. It looks like Baltasar Cormica. I say that's right. <laughs> yeah. But he directed Everest. Right. And he's he's really good at these like long, continuous one take shots. And the whole shipwreck is kind of like it's. If this is one of those smulty Nicholas Sparks movies, it's the best shot one you've ever seen, I can tell you that much. <laughs> so is it more romantic or is it more action? Look, it's a bit of both because... Really? It's like split down the middle? Yes. No. What? <laughs> See, what happens <laughs> is that we get them on the ship and then there's a parallel storyline about the characters and how they meet and fall in love. So it switches between angles where you're seeing them trying to survive on the ship and this storm, which doesn't come right at the beginning. So that drops you right in there. And then them on safe dry land (laughs) and falling in love. Does that split the film in two? Like, does that mean it doesn't gel very well? I mean, they did a good job. I think flashbacks in films, they tend to be overused. So it, it didn't. It wasn't necessary, I don't think. They didn't need to split it that way. Have flashbacks ever worked? Can you think of a film where you've watched flashbacks in a movie and gone, yeah, this is fantastic? What comes to mind for me is Sully, okay. which is sort of the same situation That's as well. Tom Hanks, uh, yeah. the plane crashing in the, the Hudson, Hudson River. River. Yeah. yeah, so it was a big news spectacle. Um, and it's about the incident, which only takes place in a matter of hours, minutes. Yeah. And... So you don't have a lot to go on in the actual movie if it was just about the plane crash, but then it flashes back to the situation leading up to that. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would parallel that story with. So it's like if we don't see them in the past, then we don't care about them. Yeah, so you're just jumping inside their memories. But that that can be a bit of a cheat, right? Because obviously <laughs> they say, you know, show, don't Control tell. shift Z. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> he, he's got the, the cheat code in the script and he's yeah, yeah, yeah. X, 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 Y, up, up, down. <laughs> because the thing is, like, you should be able to show information and, and get how people are feeling and, and whatnot across without having to cut back to them in a cafe saying, this is why I feel this way as well. So yeah. I, that's that's the only bit to me that was like, I, I understand that this is a way to represent it and I'm not smart enough to know how to do it the other way, but there, <laughs> there must be another way to have 
I guess, conveyed some of this without so consistently cutting back. I wonder if that's in the book. I wonder if they've like lifted that from the book or if that's a directing choice or, or a scriptwriter's choice. Yeah. Were any of us smart mm-hmm. enough to have read it? Read it? <laughs> nope. No, I like movies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This isn't, this isn't, this isn't the, the book b- crew. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So in a film that's all about two cast members, how do they go? How is, how's the acting? So Shailene Woodley, you know, speaking as someone that doesn't necessarily have an opinion about her, uh, after this film, I quite like her. I think she's great. I, I, I haven't heard of her. She's from the Divergent series. Right. I mean, to be fair, I haven't heard of him either. Sam Claflin, uh, he's he's in the Hunger Games. He's in a few minor roles. They both made their rounds in like those young adult fiction adaptations. Mm-hmm. So like Divergent, and he was in the Hunger Games. And yep. She was in the Fault in Our Stars. I think was her kind of. I guess what propelled her to like romantic lead status. So how is she in this? Yeah. In my I, I think film? she's great. And she not only is she great in this, but she actually produced this and went and got the rights for this story. Oh ah. really? So I think you can see that she's really really into this. Which makes it sadder that I don't think Sam Claflin yep. isn't quite at her level, I would say. I would say that, that her performance kind of outshines him. Not that he's bad, but she's just very, very good. Oh, yeah, but this is a, definitely a story about her. Yeah. This is Tammy as a character. This story is about her. So who should see this film? People who want a little bit more of an action love story, mm-hmm. maybe. Yeah, it's about human endurance and the love that overcomes difficult situations. Um, so it does have that. Love story. So is it like a date night film that both parties might enjoy? Yeah. Is, is that point. what they've done here? Well, I think this is a pretty good date movie. You know, it, it it is romantic. There are scenes that are quite romantic, even if the chemistry isn't spot on all the time. Mm-hmm. But it's not too schmaltzy and it's not too, you know, you're not going to have a, yeah. a, a Zac Efron standing in the driveway <laughs> waving goodbye as she drives off in a pickup truck in middle That's America. That's a shame. Every movie should end like that. <laughs> No matter what. No matter what. Like the what post-credit is, scene is yeah, always Zac Efron like, just waving yeah. goodbye as at the you end leave of a, the cinema. At the end of a drift, people are like, what? Is that was Zac that? Efron? <laughs> no, it's more serious than that. We're making light, but this actually happened it to did. these people. Yeah. And I think true stories always hit you harder because you're imagining this happen to real people, not just characters, mm-hmm. not actors on a screen. So there's that element as well if you really like true stories and want to know what actually happened to these people. Also in cinemas this week, Jurassic World, which we're talking about last episode. Have uh, people been showing up? People yeah. been loving it? Yeah, I, w- I was working last night and the first public screenings were showing from like 7pm and they were all sold out. Yeah, so, wow. yeah, people looking forward to it. Yeah, never underestimate the appeal of a dinosaur. Or a gay man. Or I a believe gay man. Ideal Home as well, which we talked about last week. Yes, yes. If you've got your fill of dinosaurs already, uh, you know what? Take a chance. Go see Ideal Home. I think it's a, it's a great movie that deserves to be seen. It's funny. It's sweet. And uh, it's maybe kind of important. Who knows? What can I help you with, Lord of Darkness? I'm looking for a date. The date is Friday, July 13th. No, no. I want to meet someone. Understood. You want to eat dim sum. Don't you get it? I want to go on a date. I'm lonely. I understand. You want baloney. Now, there's usually quite a lot written about a film, right? Not just reviews, but interviews with cast and crew and behind-the-scenes reports and news on why a scheduled release has changed and this, that and the other. I have found exactly nothing about Hotel Transylvania 3. What is it? What's it about? Well, it's a good question, Hotel Transylvania 3. Uh, The answer is we're not quite sure because we haven't seen it yet because it hasn't been screened. Though I thought we can talk about what we do know about it and the franchise in general because there's some stuff I've discovered about this franchise over the last few years that might kind of surprise you. So the Hotel Transylvania movies, this third one, subtitled uh, Summer Vacation, uh, so the Hotel Transylvania movies are all about the old classic monsters, your Dracula, the the mummy, Frankenstein. Okay, all like all... Smashed together. All smashed together, all living in a hotel. Uh, and Dracula's played by Adam Sandler in these movies. Uh, but the third one, they go on a, a what's called a monster cruise, and Dracula, feeling a little bit lonely, uh, falls in love with the captain of the ship that turns out to be a descendant of the famous monster hunter Van Helsing. Oh, isn't that a spoiler? 
I don't think it is because this this reveal, if you will, comes like a minute into the movie trailer. And then the rest of the trailer is them trying to keep Dracula away into from the her. trailer. Oh, okay. Into the trailer, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, you've never heard of Hotel Transylvania, Karen, nope. is that right? And uh, have you have you ever seen any of them, Bar? <laughs> I think I've seen the first one, but because yeah, that so was a very long time ago, I don't remember. I remember seeing the second one when it was out in cinemas. So to us, it's kind of when like this. Uh, like two years ago, two okay. or three years ago. So to us, it's kind of like this weird entity that exists that we have no idea about. But I've got some nieces and nephews who are so, so excited for this movie more than The Incredibles 2. Right. And when thinking about it now, there's been this is the third movie in, I think, six years maybe. The Incredibles was 14 years ago. They didn't grow up with that, but yeah. they've grown up with yeah. Hotel Transylvania. <laughs> yeah, totally. yeah, to the point it. where this is the third movie and there's a TV series now as well, apparently. Huh. Incredibles 2 is kind of like a kid's film for adults <laughs> that yeah. grew up with The Incredibles, but this is a kid's film for kids. For kids. Yeah. yeah, classic. And they love it. These movies are huge money makers. Well, when I was a kid, I loved vampires and monsters and things like that. And then you grow up and you get more into the adult version of those ones. Yeah. Um, but start them young. Get yeah. them into the vampires now. <laughs> and this is a cute way to kind of bring it back. Like, you know, you've got your your famous Dracula and Frankenstein and what have you. But isn't it a cute idea to – it's the, that theme of like everyone gets along and it's all colourful and it's bright and kids just go nuts for it. I am Captain Erica. You must be the one and only Dracula. There's something about an accent that makes a man sound so intelligent. So with Pixar films, we know a lot about the makers. We know a lot about, you know, uh, is it, uh, I was going to say Larry Bird. I think he's a basketballer. <laughs> Brad, uh, Brad Bird. Bird. <laughs> you know, we know, we know about the, the cast and the directors and the studio. It seem, you know, it seems to be out there. But who's behind this movie? So it was actually written by Michael McCullers, who wrote Austin Powers. Really? So that, yeah, so that seems a bit of a stretch. Uh, I don't know if any Austin Powers theme will come into this kid's movie. Maybe Hopefully that's why not. Adam Sandler's in it from that <laughs> SNL scene. Yeah. yeah. Could be. Well, yeah. Austin Powers is colourful and bright yeah, and happy, true. right? Um, really? Aust- that's crazy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Interesting jump for him as a writer, I'd, I'd yeah. say. Um, but the funny thing is Hotel Transylvania's got the same director and – of another difficult name, I'm going to try and say, Gendy Tartakovsky. Right. Yeah. Uh, well done. Who, <laughs> I'm saying with no knowledge of yes. whether that's right or I not. Think so. um, Having it, a go is the yeah. important thing. I feel. Um, butchering people's names. Uh, this director wasn't initially going to be part of the project. He said years ago after the second one that two was enough for him. Um, but then he came back on board. Pun intended. Yeah. Hey. Get it? Is, a is, that, is that a good sign though? To be like, I've made two. I don't want to make any more. Yeah. Back the money truck into the driveway. <laughs> the you know what? Not I have enough. thought of a third idea. No, apparently he got inspiration from a miserable family vacation and then came back on okay. to the project. It's so interesting because like, you never think about these movies being like, you know, the director thinking, oh, I've had a, 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 a hit of inspiration. I need to go write like a Wes Anderson movie or something. But you never think about that happening for Hotel Transylvania series, do you? No. And yet here we are. <laughs> so who should see this film? I think anyone that's a fan of... I mean, that's a silly question, isn't it? Kids. Yes. yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and there's, there's specifically, there's different kinds of animated movies, right? You've got your Pixar ones. You've got your DreamWorks, like your Shrek and whatnot. The Sony ones are kind of in their weird own world. They did all the Cloudy with a Chance of Meatball movies, uh-huh. and they're a bit silly oh, yeah. and a bit a more bit colorful. Goofy and... A bit goofy. A bit goofy, yeah. yeah. The Grinch, them? The Grinch is DreamWorks. Oh. Uh, but... It... <laughs> <laughs> But recently, um, Peter Rabbit was Sony. Oh, okay. yeah, which that was did a really huge, well. A great kids' film, Peter Rabbit. Uh, so it, they're a little goofier, a little funnier, a little sillier. Yeah, kids. And <laughs> parents who want to uh, entertain their kids for maybe a couple of hours. Yeah. Or, or potentially fans cinema. of the Austin Powers franchise. <laughs> totally. Well, no one's seen it, so we have to wait till it's released to find out if it's Shagadelic. <laughs> Now, each week we have a Village Cinemas Gold Class double pass to give away. Who's our winner this week, Cambo? Last week we asked the question, if you could clone anything back into existence, what would it be? Got Louie's email here. Hello, uh, Louie. He said, if I could clone something back into existence, it would be mixtapes. And they've written mixtape in all capital letters. That's very important <laughs> to know. Yeah. It says, nothing screams I love you more than a mixtape. 
accept shouting your loved one to a Gold Class movie experience. That's oh. true. So, you know what? We'll make that come mm. through. You're the winner. Uh, I'll email you those Gold Class double passes. <laughs> well, for your chance to win a Village Cinema's Gold Class double pass next week, we're after your answer to the question, what's the most far out place you've seen a movie? Tell us a story. To win, send your answer and contact details to win at thecinemacrew.com.au. Next week, we'll hear about the next in the long line of Marvel superhero flicks, Ant-Man and the Wasp, plus a kid's movie that had to go and get some scenes cut out before it was released. Oh, and I love a good costume drama. So the author of Frankenstein gets a biopic as Elle Fanning stars in Mary Shelley. Until then, thanks, Cambo. Thanks. Thanks, Vari. Thanks. I'm Kyron Wheatley, and this is The Cinema Crew with Village Cinemas.